Welcome to the Sideline Live podcast. Subscribe for more episodes and follow our social media at the Sideline Live. We'd love to hear from you. On episode 23, I'm delighted to be joined by Longford senior footballer Mickey Quinn. We had a great chat about all things performance, skills, his time training and playing AFL in Australia and much more. I really enjoyed chatting to Mickey so I hope you enjoyed the episode. Hi Mickey, thanks a million for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me Orla. Uh, can you give a little bit of background for the listeners who might not know who you are? Yeah, um, Mickey Quinn, um, the over the hill of the 30 mark um, <laughs> and uh, he and Matt's teacher in Longford in St. Men's College and uh, Longford footballer and done a stint uh, in Australia playing AFL with Essendon Bombers as well. Very good. So we're going to start off with what sparked the conversation. What's your definition or interpretation of high performance? Yeah, um, since uh, touch and base uh, a few weeks back, I've kind of been I've got stuck into uh, different podcasts and bits and pieces, and I'm an avid. I was going to say an, uh, an avid reader, but I'm not. I'm a compulsive book buyer and get to about the 20 page mark and give up um, and get distracted <laughs> by another book, and I'm a disaster like that. Um, and I need to get in on the other book. But my definition of high performance, I was I think we broke it down into four different areas of. Uh, skill based physical fitness base um, and then I think it was kind of toss up with the last with um, psychologically based and um, that mental preparation um, and then just just general life skills um, and communication skills kind of all kind of the other two little bit separate but having that that base and the knowledge to put all four of those kind of pillars together to to lead towards optimal performance um, would be where I, I'd probably thrive or look at things probably um, as an athlete, as a, as a coach, um, and then probably from the teaching side of things too. Very good. So could you potentially put those pillars as percentages, as not really order of importance, but kind of how that builds up into your kind of definition, as you said, optimum performance? Yeah, I, I kind of... Do you know, a lot of it is individual based um, with physical fitness and the skill side of things. Um, but then when you go to the other pillars um, about working as a team player, the psychological side of things and that kind of as yourself, but also being able to work, work well with others um, and especially in a team environment that's going to be huge and um, that you have those leadership skills built up or communication skills really. Um, that that will help you as a leader or as a member of a team to kind of to rally the troops around you or or, or work work together. So um, I think the big thing is to focus on on yourself mostly, um, and I think that side of things would be the skill and skill element of the games, um, and also the the physical fitness. And I suppose probably from my own side of things, I definitely had different pillars where I put all my eggs in one basket and kind of neglect one over the other and kind of the longer your career goes on or when you start drifting into coaching you start understanding and trying to balance them as a player and then even as a coach that you're working on them too and um, like I'd probably get caught up on the physical side of things and um, even at the moment you know the skill side is kind of when you don't have uh, you don't have teammates around you. You can't practice this. You can't do this. So, okay, well, physical fitness is something, or physical and um, fitness is something that you're going to work on and focus on, and then you're going to neglect the other pillars. So, trying to keep them all balanced and kind of was trying to think of an analogy that you're juggling them all at once, and that you know it's very easy to keep one up in the air, but if you're trying to juggle three or four at the same time and, and keep focusing on uh, all four of them. It's it's hard, but yeah. one is feeds into the other just as much, um, and especially the kind of psychological side of things. It's something that probably I think everyone neglects, and definitely I would have in the past. That um, 
enjoy even that reflection on reflecting after games what went well what didn't go well and um, that's something an area and um, that I've definitely kind of learned to improve on and and just sitting down journaling what's what's working for me what's not working for me um, you know why am I feeling good and um, and and going back looking through bits and pieces of journals that I keep journals for just every day and um, different bits and pieces trying to keep track of habits okay I've trained trained today done a gym session hydrated really well hit my protein targets and um, geez I feel feel really good and um, other days geez I'm feeling I'm feeling shit today why is that and um, poor sleep um, and you're kind of starting to not just look at the good things but also looking at the bad things and that's something yeah. that I kind of learned that you'll always look at your good performance but there's there's times there where there's bad days um, whether it was in the AFL or in Croke Park um, that you kind of okay let's just park the bus on that and forget about it and then it's okay. put to the back of your mind but are you actually learning anything from it and um, so yeah it's kind of they all feed into each other, but I think little things that I've developed is trying to figure out habits um, that I have or that I can work on, good or bad, um, to try and help, help me as a person, um, whether it be a footballer, a teacher, husband, friend, um, father, any of those things that, you know, what what is it? Um, and it, it does come back to very basic things would be getting getting your exercise in and hydrating, getting enough sleep in, um, and just staying off the phone some of the times in the morning and night time. That's something that I've kind of I've tried put in place since January is kind of stay off the phone half an hour uh, in the morning and at night time. And you know, it definitely has uh, has helped me. Mm. Okay, yeah, loads. I've written notes here beside me because I want to ask about loads of that. But I'm really interested about the journaling. Do you find that it helps to kind of write things down, particularly when it goes bad? Let's say like a bad performance that you can nearly park it. Or do you find that do you find that hard to park bad performances? You know, when you're walking off the pitch. Yeah, I kind of I went through a phase where you get really, I wouldn't say upset, but frustrated and annoyed by um, those performances and uh, do you know why why was that and, and then you get you nearly get too ups, ups, obsessed with it in the sense that there's times where I go back and it's like I was micromanaging everything that you know was it the night before where I put my left boot into my bag first <laughs> things like that well it wouldn't be not to that degree but in the yeah. dressing room, you know, that final preparation, did I do my tuck jumps before the game started? Did I? And you're looking at things, it's like, that's not actually any yeah. way important. Um, yeah. And you start to probably learn a little bit more that you're kind of touching at straws more so than anything. Um, yeah. But definitely for, for games and that, I'd, I'd have a separate journal and jot down um, I pick three areas that I'd try and focus on for a game um, okay. obviously you're trying to pick areas that you can control or, or measure um, as such but it's all probably objective to you and how you felt the game went um, yeah. so whether that be communication um, for me is definitely always one of the one of my three um, and that and then it's like oh communication yeah yeah did I communicate tick no I kind of it's like that was a buzzword for a while. It's like tick or X. It's like no, I need to be a bit more. It's like okay, did I set up our our own kickouts? Was I vocal? Um, you know, opposition kickouts. Was I instructing how we wanted to set up? Um, was I positive to my teammates? And that was definitely something. You know, try and be positive. Tell someone they've done something good. Um, and then work rate. Work rate. You're trying to. The way I broke down my work rate was I had a five four three two one. Um, now what were the? Uh, I think one was a block down, two intercepts, uh, three uh, track backs or chase backs, picking up someone else's man maybe. Four would be line breaks and five uh, good passes or something along those lines. And I try and break it down with that. Um, that's okay. Well, there's something now. Uh, there's or that could be the skill focus sorry not the work rate 
um, and kind of fed into the work rate would be the, the third one. Uh, and then at the end was just enjoy um, and kind of kind of get so caught up in, in the process and doing this and doing that, but you kind of forget about the enjoyment side of things or I would have in the past. So that was an area that I said, right, big red pen, uh, enjoy it. Um, yeah. And, you know, it's definitely helped me. Um, yeah. And kind of looking back and it's probably something that, I let myself down and I don't probably look back and things enough to kind of see, okay, if this is what went well. That's what went well. I'll take that. And um, that reflection side of things is something that I definitely can improve on. Yeah. Okay. That's really interesting. And I'm interested here as well. You mentioned the boots and the boots and the tuck drums. What's your sort of pregame routine? Uh, you sound very superstitious. <laughs> yeah, not even. I'm kind of, it's stay out my way within the 24 <laughs> hours of the game. Um, like very catchy, edgy, really. Um, like I, I probably get to the stage where until I have my bag thrown in the car and I'm in the car heading for the football pitch or heading to get the bus to the football yeah. pitch, um, it's almost like, right, yeah, now, now it's game day, now I'm ready. Whereas up until that point, it's like everything's edgy. Did I put that in the bag? Um, better check right. that. Um, and it's an area that I kind of need to relax a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and that's yeah. what the team is, which is very intense. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, look at it, it's kind of, you kind of pick up bits and pieces and you try and learn from um, what worked and what doesn't. Um, and probably I got to stages before games where I worked myself up that much that I'd, I'd get sick before a game. Um, oh, and then it's like, okay, I'm ready to go now. Um, but you're like, Jesus, that, that's not right. That's crazy. And whether it was drinking too much water or kind of almost just hyping yourself up to, to a level that it wasn't really necessary or beneficial. Um, so, yeah, yeah pre-game routine, um, just it's usually uh, gear is always ready the night before. Um, and even the night or two nights before, I'd probably have my my journal and done and jot down the few bits and pieces that I want to, to focus in on um, and kind of keep that time. I'd leave, leave it out on, on, on an island there that I can kind of have a look and okay, yeah, 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 tick, tick. Okay, such and such, marking this person or you want to do this. Okay, and then um, little things like that and um, everything ready and try and be prepped and ready to go the night before that you're not rushing. And um, so... Being being organised would definitely be something, and um, that, and even being on time, and um, you know, I'd probably prefer to be at the ground three hours before a game rather than than an hour, and um, you know, and sometimes when, you know, I got to the stage where I wouldn't go with some people because you know I want to be on time. Yeah. <laughs> oh God. So, right. Yeah. yeah. So I might have told them that now, but um, yeah, they'll know now anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and do you it, it you know, I like the way you said get to the game three hours before is that to help settle the nerves would you get nervous before a game at all yeah like it's funny I, I nerves are kind of I never really I wouldn't say I never really got nervous definitely nerves but I kind of got to the stage where it was almost like building 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 mm-hmm. working yourself up to a stage and um, and then that release was getting to the ground for me um, a lot of the time. It wasn't even running out on the pitch and, okay, I'm ready. It was just parking the car and walking into the dressing room was like, okay, now, now I'm on. Um, so, uh, yeah, that was kind of, that was my kind of way of looking at it. Yeah, okay. And you mentioned there before you, you would nearly hype yourself up too much and like drink too much water and all that. How did you get away from that? Did you get help from anyone? Did, was it just trial and error? Uh, trial and error, but probably just generally chatting to different um, different psychologists. We would have one or two working with us for for Longford and picked up bits and pieces off them. Um, and then Anne Marie Kennedy would have had great conversations with her when I was um, teaching in Castlenock College. And um, she's uh, the the Dublin uh, or would have been sports psychologist for the Dublin team for a while, and I think she's with golf in Ireland and a few different um, and really enjoyed those conversations and picking up little nuggets um, and pieces that that okay 
she said this, write it down, what worked or what, what you could change or adapt. Um, and then even podcasts and books and stuff like that, that you're, you're always kind of trying to learn different bits and pieces uh, from. And the journaling was one of the things that, that has definitely worked yeah. or helped. Yeah. Was there anything big you took away from those conversations with Anne-Marie or from the sports psychologist? Oh, yeah, probably off the top of my head. No, it's, it's kind of um, like very hard to pinpoint one one exact thing. But definitely it was kind of it's just that kind of being mindful of and being in the moment rather than focusing on and the controllables that not getting too caught up in stuff that look at what's going on if such and such is happening you can't really do anything about it so yeah. is it any good worrying about it um, and that's probably in hindsight looking back sometimes as a captain of different teams that oh, because you get the cap- title of captain that you kind of try and take on too much responsibility I found or kind of try and control things that you know you just have to almost lead by example rather than trying to worry about wonder did he eat his pasta the night before he came <laughs> and yeah. it, for example stuff like that but you kind of just worry about your yourself and kind of and lead by example was the best thing that you you could do um rather than getting caught up in stuff that it's not going to you're not going to be able to change or, or make a difference up with yeah okay yeah and do you have any particular method that you use to stay in the moment in the big games um, great question. Um, do you know, I suppose the looking back, like visualizing before games, I find the journal ties in with that. that if you were writing down those few things that when you write down those few things, you can actually see them happen or visualize them uh, and visualize them. Then you write them down whatever way in, in the lead up to the game. And, and that definitely helps. And then when it comes to staying in the moment in the game, it could be just simply, um, going back to those one or two points um, that you had, okay, let's just go back to them and reset. And so whether it be just taking a, uh, taking a breath and just taking a step back um, and, and having that kind of mantra or focus that you're going back to that, um, that you have written down. Mm, okay yeah so I'm gonna um I wanted to talk to you about your experience because I suppose you've you've had a really interesting journey in terms of being exposed to high performance and professional environments uh with the likes of soccer Gaelic football and AFL yeah um and it's something that I I love um and it's something that I kind of mentioned it before that when when I am finished playing I, I do hope to to go traveling and, and kind of seeing different bits and pieces of those environments. Like I remember going to Irish rugby training and sitting watching and trying to see, okay, well, what, what are they, what's he doing? Connor Murray watching him doing runs along the side and stuff yeah. like that. I'm intrigued by um, that environment and how, how it all go, runs and works. Um, but I suppose you take different bits and pieces like in the AFL um, when I was over there, like the, the, the training standard um was just phenomenal um you know when you're at the club the recovery side of things um and even just little habits like um running to the furthest cone um it was kind of the big thing at the moment or at there uh, was distance covered in a game or even in training and you were kind of produced with your GPS in a training or a game and it's like how in God's name did he run two and a half kilometers further than me. Um, and then you're looking back at a training session, right? I'm going to keep an eye on this. Um, I was watching some of the kind of elite guys or the guys at the club that were hitting huge numbers. And I was like, okay, there he is. He's after running to the farthest cone. Um, anytime a drill goes to stack, you'll all pick the, the guys out who pick the short one right beside the coach and say, right, we're into this drill now. And there's 12 lads behind that cone and yeah, one yeah. at the farthest one away. Um, but it's funny too, the furthest one away, um, if you watch the guys that are on the furthest one away, you can pick uh, whereabouts or what, what their role is in the team. Um, and that was something that stood out, stood out for me and it kind of something that I kind of brought back. And it's funny, I remember um, being back with my club for about six months and for training. And I suppose they wouldn't have seen me probably with the club that much. I was kind of straight off with the county. 
Um, and after a while, it was it was a race. There was three or four that were racing to the furthest cone, and then you're like, you're bringing a few with you, which kind of it, it became a bit of a game. And it's like as soon as the, the coach would say, right, we're into this one, and it was a race out for the furthest cone. It's like, Jesus, you know, this could actually be. It's a bit of fun, but you're yeah. getting an, an extra sprint in, and and uh, it kind of maybe set the tone for for a lot of the younger lads too. Yeah, I like the way you said it keep, keeps it fun because sometimes maybe you lose sight of that. How did you find that professional environment and being so focused on uh, your game and your performance? Like, I suppose you would have had time off during the day, but it's very different to GEA. Yeah, I probably, like, it's funny looking back and then I kind of think, Jesus, uh, was I, like, what you know now is always great, but looking back and mm-hmm. it, uh, it was it's a tough environment too that when things are great they're brilliant and then when they're not and um, you're slated and you kind of um you go back and you're like jesus reading bits and pieces of comments or an article mm-hmm. in the paper or remember different things happening or remember a uh, mis- not mistake i kind of got through and goal in a game and fluffed it, a shot thought that it was been chased down and rushed it and completely missed it and I was like oh jeez and those kind of things you dwell on them but I do think mistakes that I would have made kind of had not gone the consequences from coaches like oh he's not ready he's not ready for this game um, okay. and then you're trying to you're trying to undo some of those mistakes um, that you might make in a game and maybe trying to push things out too far and you're kind of the analysing side of things um kind of over analyzing it and you mentioned it there that the fun easy goes out of it very quickly and I think that's what what probably got me there in the first place um, and probably why I started off so well was just pure enjoyment and naivety to just go out and play and you know do what you what I done best was kind of sell a few dummies give and go and enjoy it um, and then when it came, became too focused on well, your structure you need to be standing here for this play you need to be set up for this kick out and um, you need to be doing this that you're so robotic that um i think that impacted on me negatively that i got too caught up on that um, and it took completely away from from what my game was was kind of flair and kind of off the cuff almost um, and it's the same with gaelic football that I kind of see it at the moment that you have flair players, and you have, you have donkeys that do the work, um, and the donkeys get the ball to those flair players, and those players are the ones that will win or lose the game. But you prefer to go down trying um, and doing something that might work or might not work than actually just kind of be safe the whole time. And yeah. that probably comes with the fun side and taking risks, and um, yeah. that I think we probably. It, it goes over a game like why does everyone love to watch Jeremy Connolly um, Shane Walsh with Galway because they do the unexpected thing they do things that they're probably not supposed to and when they pay when they come off it's like oh wow that's brilliant um, and yeah. that's brilliant to watch and um, you know it's all well and good being uh, okay 100% accurate safe pass and uh, the whole time but I think you have to have that in your game that you're willing to try and and do things because when it comes to the last two or three minutes of the game and you're a point down um, it's all well and good trying to do it then but you, know, you might not have built up that ability if you're not trying it in training or in games previously definitely yeah I, I actually had a couple of those points written down about losing that creative flair because I definitely think we are and as you said when you went to Australia it was very structured very kind of to the point you do this and you know you do it to the best of your ability do you think that we are becoming too structured in the GEA particularly maybe at club level yeah definitely it definitely with club level but it kind of all feeds around like it comes in I, I do think it's, it comes in cycles and um, mm. you know at the moment you know you look at soccer high press and in, on kick outs at the moment is kind of every team is doing it and every team's going short with kick outs whereas in the past it was almost lamb um, and probably links to Gaelic football similar the the short kick out um, the trying to change the way the kick out has been done and um, Stephen Cluxon has kind of 
on his own has kind of changed how kickouts are, are managed in Gaelic football. And I think everyone is trying to do something similar, um, but probably don't have Stephen Cluxton and goals. Yeah. <laughs> so I think most coaches are trying to replicate or copy a certain style or structure that um, is the trend or is on point at the moment. Um, and I suppose the way certain teams like look at the northern teams maybe more physical in the past but that has kind of changed um i do think you kind of have to as a coach you're looking at your players and what suits rather than okay we're going to play a sweeper because every team in the country is playing a sweeper and um, you know why not play seven forwards and back your defenders to go man and man five v five might be more space but if you have enough pressure on up the field you know, and that bit of creative thinking as players and to kind of from coaches to give it to players, um, is, is something that I, I do think is lacking. And you know, like the way Dublin are playing now, they've adapted to probably what different teams have tried to do to them, and they've kind of they've done the running game and uh, transition at pace up the field, they've done the kind of being patient because teams are set up. Um, and you kind of have to have a few a few different things up your sleeve. Um, but I do think it's kind of the coaching side of things that are kind of can can hinder uh, or inhibit players from from showing that, that creative flair. And that's something that um, you, you really have to be mindful of um, as a coach, as a teacher, um, and probably the last one as a player that you don't want that taken away. Yeah, and how do you think, maybe particularly at underage level, that coaches can really emphasize? I don't know if that's the right word. That creativity and not let it kind of not let the players just be so focused on their performance. Yeah, I think probably small sided games is the big thing at the moment, and um, well, it probably has been for the last number of years. That small sided games are the way to improve skills, decision making. Oh, brilliant, I de- definitely agree with that I do think we probably skip to the small side of games very quickly um, you know even under 8s under 10s even under 12s that if they haven't got those basic skills yeah. kind of developed um, well, why go into those games it, like you have to have a certain baseline level of those skills if you're not able to kick uh, comfortably um, hand pass comfortably um, pick up catch and um, those basic ones, then going into a, a 1v1, 2v2, 3v3 situation um, isn't going to actually help, I find, from looking at it from a really underage point of view. Um, and I think what, what happens is small-sided games for, for coaches um, at that level can actually turn out to be 7-a-side, 11-a-side, that small side. But you need to go smaller, like 1v1, yeah. 2v2, 3v3 is like at that age, I think there needs to be nearly a cap, mm-hmm. albeit there's an awful lot of organisation and prep for setting up that many football pitches. Yeah. But yeah. I think that creativeness as a coach to kind of look that way rather than getting too caught up in small sided games, right? 7v7. Do you know, there's probably going to be one predominant player in both teams um, and they're allowed one play or two plays. A small pitch like that, those players will run amok regardless. Um, and that's kind of not the whole the whole point, that you're trying to develop everyone as best you can. Um, and that's that's an area where I feel that the individual skills um, having time and everyone has, a, everyone has a ball that you're practising flicks and tricks and skills and okay get the ball from the ground up into your hand uh without using uh, a, a pickup you know yeah. do a rainbow flick do something mm-hmm. try something show me a new flick um, and then you kind of think geez there's something um, and you're given kind of you're giving them that little bit of an autonomy to, to try different things that it's okay to try different things rather than okay you're supposed to hand pass like this mm-hmm. kind of yeah I, I, I see that and that's an area that I think the best coaches in in Gaelic football, soccer, any sport, I think when they go back and coach the underage or the, the youth, I see it in, in clubs that your best coaches should be with the youngest um, 
under eights, tens, twelves, fourteens. You know, mm. this thing of worrying about winning uh, under age titles. You know, it's it's not really the point. It's trying to develop them as players, um, and yeah. that they love the game. Firstly, that they're able to compete. Um, and if you if you do that, then you'd hope that once they hit the eighteen uh, or minor age group, that they'll still want to keep playing afterwards um, yeah. and and make that push through. Definitely. Yeah. And I, I also think maybe we don't give kids enough credit. I'm coaching underage and during lockdown, we would have done a lot of come up with something. And some of the videos they were sending in blew us away as coaches. We were like, oh, my God, like we couldn't do any of the stuff they were they were sending in. Like Exactly. And uh, unless you're in, a, in an environment or a position like that uh, where the video and send it in or they all have a ball each. Yeah. You're not going to see that. Um, I was like, geez, I didn't know you could do that flick. How? Oh, I actually play soccer, and um, you know, three months of the year, six I play with this soccer team, um, and you start to realise, right, there's there's something that uh, I didn't know about that that boy or girl, and they they are skillful, but maybe their confidence is low, and they don't get the ball enough in the game to actually see yeah. that. So yeah, you start to it opens your eyes a little bit. It's like okay, she's there's someone now that I could really actually keep giving them feedback and positive feedback and, and bump them up and there's mm. definitely potential there. They're maybe just too timid or too small. Um, but without seeing something like that, they're the kind of players that kind of drift away and you're kind of, oh, they would have, I don't know, he just, he didn't like it or she didn't like mm. it. Um, whereas if you kind of pick up those things earlier on um, in, in their life and as a coach that it might actually be more beneficial for them. Yeah, I know you had a couple of viral videos there of your skills over the last <laughs> lockdown. Like that, just the same kind of thing, just messing and um, yeah. trying different things. I remember when I was younger, just out practicing bits and pieces with um, my brother, trying flick ups and tricks. Um, and you learn different things. Um, and that was, that was where I kind of started. And then in AFL, mm -hmm. it was the same kind of thing that at the end of training, it was individual needs. So you go off with uh, defenders, a defensive coach, attacking coach, shooting coach, um, and it could be you're doing spoiling today because um, it could have worked. You might have missed a couple of spoils at the weekend. Mm. Um, it could be shooting because um, you everyone's to shoot. <laughs> <laughs> and then when after all that is finished, um, you'd have maybe 10 minutes of just your own bit of time of, of messing and it could have been just shots from the boundary and um, trying little dribble shots into into the goals uh, stuff like that and, and I think that's where probably I, I would call it your, you learn your craft um, and your craft is all those different skills whether it be a one-handed take and um, mm. holding off a defender and taking taking a ball with one hand or whether it be a really clean pick up off a uh, flick up off the ground or mm. or something like that or even some of your tricks and, and, and stuff that you might use it in a game mm. but it's definitely that ball control or foot control with flick it, flicking it up off the ground can help your dummy solos just that feel of the ball off the boot um, and even with the handling the ball that much and um, you're going to have that dexterity built up that kind of you might do something in a game that it didn't come from nowhere um, and yeah. you definitely have practiced or done something in training to lead towards that or help with it definitely yeah and how much do you think your time in afl kind of influence your own individual training definitely um Oh, massively from a training point of view would have would have been huge and probably the, the time that you give up um like one of the things that would have taken back from was um the heart rate training um you know we'd have a uh, typical schedule for pre-season would be monday wednesday friday would be the big days monday and uh, training in the morning nine till maybe 11 half 10 11 and then you get your recovery and your shake in ice baths um, and then you'd have flexibility into lunch and then you'd have gym sessions after lunch maybe a team meeting um, and then after team meeting uh, massage uh, so you'd be eight in the eight, half eight in the morning eight o'clock till, till maybe four or five o'clock monday wednesday friday 
and then Tuesday and Thursday would be kind of half days. So a Tuesday session would be a running block. And um, so different runs. So probably something that I've been taking a lot of my session from at the moment is running sessions or similar sessions that I would have done. One K Ks to uh, 800s, 600s, fours, twos, ones, and, and just picking and mixing. And from those sessions, we would have um, always use heart rate monitors. Um, what's your heart rate now after doing three eight hundreds um, and your rest straight away when you come across the line okay heart rate's down to 160 now and um, okay you can actually move up a group because you're hitting those times and um, you're hitting those times for the 800s and uh, so we'll jump you up a group which the, the group ahead might be you're doing the 800s in three or four seconds quicker and yeah. they'd be basing that off your heart rate and stuff. And that kind of gave me a, an interest for that. It was like, okay, you know when you're training and um, when you're when the heart rate's on, that there's no there's no hiding. Um, and yeah. I suppose that's something that I kind of enjoy that when I come back in, look at the watch or look at the, the app there and you're kind of checking. It's like, okay, geez, I did hit a, a max heart rate there and I did hit a max speed. Um, and it's telling me that, my workload was was really high um, and you can kind of manage your training off that and that's probably what I've been doing for, for the lockdown and and that um, and using it as, as a gauge I suppose the other side of things you get too caught up on that and the physical yeah. side of things and you forget about the skill and then you get okay I want to really get a blow out here and a lot of probably my training I kind of you want to go to the well the whole time rather than some of your training just there's nothing wrong with a light jog or where a nice handy session and um, whereas I do think it's almost a culture that you have to be dogged out the whole time yeah definitely you have to hit the certain <laughs> kilometers in the GPS exactly yeah. and how did you find that then coming back from Australia when you were on that schedule and you had so much focus on improving and those individual sessions to that amateur set up well it is an amateur setup because everyone works with the with the intercounty scene yeah i kind of it's amazing probably looking back the last 10 years that i've been back how how things have changed or how you've changed your training routine or schedule um probably i was so used to doing something every day and even a day before a game was always something that captain run um and that was something that i would have done up until probably the last two years and um, okay. probably haven't done it as much and um, so before day before a game I'd right I've 30 35 minutes on the clock and um, 10 12 minutes of a warm-up and just building up up to speed and then after that it was 20 minutes of ball work kicking 45s shots on the run and um, on my own just go to the pitch and do a few of those things. And that kind of tied in with the visualization side of things. So I kind of set myself up with a ball in a certain part of the pitch and say, right, throw it up to myself. Yeah. Okay. Play a quick one too with myself go and kick a ball on the run um, and, and things like that. So that kind of tied in. And then after that, I get in the car and go and do a recovery session in the pool for 30 minutes, just some pool walking and stretching uh, yeah. and then home and, and rest up for the rest of the day. Um, but then kind of as time went on, I was like, Jesus, you know what? Between that and then a big warm up the next day, am I actually eating into the legs too much that, you know, am I yeah. doing too much before the day before a game? And especially if we're after training on a Friday, I do that on a Saturday, game on a Sunday. Yeah. Am I pushing the boat out too much? And you start to maybe think, do you know what? I'm going to take it handy. I'm going to, scrap that session or mm. sometimes I've even sat out that Friday session team session because it might be a piss or wet of a day carrying a little bit of a niggle I'm going to do my own little bit uh, on a Saturday and you're trying to manage your training load like that and um, but that's something I've probably brought back that I was so used to training every day that I had to kind of had to do something and a lot of that was probably for myself that sometimes was like you get antsy and you kind of get edgy that I need to need to be doing more I always need to be doing something because someone else is doing it um, but kind of start to realize especially when you're getting on that it's freshness is is, yeah. is more important like and even at the moment I've kind of I'd love to be getting out doing three running sessions a week um, 
at the moment, but I'm probably only squeezing in two. Uh, so I end up doing double day, do, done a double day on Tuesday, gym in the morning, I run later on, and then the same today, I maybe do a, a bike session on Sunday and kind of just managing my time differently. Um, yeah. Probably life throws up different things. Um, do you know whether you sleep well the night before um, or not and, and whether you're feeling it today, that's something that kind of lockdown has taught me that you know you can adapt your training rather than um, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Sunday. That's when we train with Clover County yeah. and you're kind of locked in on that. Um, so that's something that kind of I've kind of managed and, and adapted to suit at the way things are at the moment and I suppose only time will tell whether yeah. I'm at the base <laughs> <laughs> yeah we'll, we'll find out soon enough <laughs> but I'm interested exactly. I'm interested when you mentioned there with the you're doing you would do a lot of individual stuff and with AFL obviously they had time to do the individual stuff do you think the GEA like the GEA coaches need to put more emphasis maybe in training on the individual side with working with different players on their maybe potential skills or some of their weaknesses? Yeah, like I, 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 it's an area that I, like 15 minutes at the end of a session should be designated for, right, coach, you're taking those six players with you, you're doing uh, defensive work, off you go, and uh, once you're working on blocking down or tackling, okay, you're going with them, shooting with the forwards or coming on the loop something along those lines uh, high catches midfielders kickouts um, and break it down to I'd love to break it down to those individual needs like I think what probably bugged me some of the times and I I see it probably from both sides now um, is John you know, right in the train in an hour beforehand and um, you do your warm up physio whatever and you're ready to go and get out on the pitch and there's times where coaches or probably different uh, coaches wouldn't have let you on the pitch because, okay, you're not kicking ball before training because you're going to get injured because some lads come and rock up, boots on, out you go, bang, oh, let's kick a few 45s. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, I saw hamstrings tight. Oh, why is that? I wonder. I, I, I have no idea why your hamstrings are tight. Um, whereas that kind of bit of trust in the players that, right, okay, here's your routine. You have to do X, Y, and Z before you can go kicking. And yeah. you're not kicking over 30 meters um, before training or whatever it is, and work it that way. Um, yeah. Whereas it's very much okay. We're not. We're all going to go out together as a team. Um, and I suppose it, it does come down to the time side of things again. Um, yeah. You're trying to manage the time as best you can. Um, sometimes it might suit someone uh, to come an hour before training and, and do that. Do a half an hour work before training. Um, or it might suit some players to do half an hour work after training or 20 minutes even um, with a coach or on their own that they know what they want to do um, and it's just managing that and I think that's the, the difficult side of things in GA and a team environment that everyone's coming from different different approaches but I think the, the knowledge and the education side of things about okay manage yourself you know, don't be doing too much and I suppose that was probably something that I would have done in the past that probably almost coaches wouldn't nearly let me out because I try, I'd be there too early, do too much and then into mm-hmm. training session. And the, the, fra- the freshness side of things was, was more important and definitely yeah. you were probably right. Yeah, okay. I, is there a particular underrated skill, do you think, in GA at the moment? Is there anything that we're, that we're overlooking as players and coaches? The hand pass and high catch, um, straight away hand pass, and um, because in Australia it's an oval ball and the pass has to go from A to B. If it hits the ground, who knows what's going to happen? <laughs> um, and that was something that you kind of I would have picked up from there. That you know, and again would have been something that I would have maybe wrote down and returned. Hand passes have to hit the target or go to chest or go to go to hand, um, yeah. and especially. You, I notice it more in winter football than summer football. You get away with the hand pass out in front, it'll bounce up, great job. But if a player has to bend down, pick up that ball, mm. um, or even a ball into a full forward, full forward, someone's coming off his shoulder at pace, but he can actually get his hands together and get the offload in time. Um, mm. And that, that goal opportunity is gone. Um, and I do think I've kind of, use different examples when I'm coaching with teams that 
do you know the, the difference in a goal scoring chance and not getting it is is a good hand pass and it could be a, a two meter hand pass or a 15 meter hand pass and if you look back at every goal that's been scored in last year's championship a lot of it is is a hand pass was the last pass or possibly two passes back that would have made that opportunity all well and good the kick pass over the top forward in and goal and um, but they're rare and um, so the hand pass is something that feels definitely neglected and, and undercoached and utilised skill. Okay, yeah. And in terms of your own individual training, what would you practice and what would you emphasise, maybe particularly at the moment, if you can get out to the pitch? Um, yeah, probably haven't been doing enough and want to do it more. Um, mm. You know, getting out and just kicking um, is definitely something. Kicking off both feet, um, probably for me, too much of a habit outside of the boot and love it and um, okay, yeah. probably taking a bit of pace off the pass uh, and probably counterproductive and uh, playing passes in probably too too fast uh, that that they're difficult to, to handle um, yeah. and probably with the new rule um, inside 45 getting the mark would probably I was like every pass nearly had to be an outside the boot pass and try and try and drill it in um, whereas that instep pass that one bounce pass is something that um skill that is it's i definitely from my own side again need to work on more that that simple just one bounce pass and um, rather than going to try and hit it on the full mm-hmm. yeah i'm interested because i was i can't remember who it was but it could have been a podcast and a player was saying they never punt kicked a ball in a game it was always either the in step or outside of the boot yeah, like it's kind of, I I don't I don't see the punt kick even all the GA cards and with all practice punt kick like yeah there are very few Michael Darren McCauley maybe and uh, and Kev Mack for goals and um, a few a few guys like that that you're looking back and that there's a punt kick and um, but look at it it is a skill um whether it, the punt kick kind of helps in keeping the trajectory of the ball down. Um, so going through and goal on the run is definitely one of those that you can kind of to keep it low. But other than that, it's rare that you see um, a kick pass out the field. It's usually around the corner or, or a hook kick in step or, or outside the boot. Um, I'm yeah. probably from working with, with Mick Bohan, simple things like that. Uh, he would have been brilliant at those complex skills like in step with the right and um, punt kick outside of the boot uh, and you're practicing all those different different kicks but it's like what we we're saying before that that feel of the ball off the boot whether it be in step punt or out step or outside the boot that you're kind of getting a feel for it and yeah. that, that you're able to to, to do it and um, mm. i suppose if you're practicing the punt kick the whole time in training you probably would bring it in in games yeah. but it, it's a skill that um, it's it's rarely used do you, if you had the opportunity I know you mentioned you you got to go to kind of Irish rugby training if you had the opportunity to, to visit any team or a training session in the world who who would you like to go and observe uh, probably two probably Pep would be some a coach that you'd love to you'd love to see the likes of him in action um, and see just the behind the scenes training uh, and just how he coaches the team and and a Premier League setup, and um, a Leeds fan myself, um, or yeah. I, I jump on the bandwagon. So <laughs> even uh, Marco Bielsa, to, to see his training methodologies and the way he he coaches teams, um, is some that's someone that you'd look at. Uh, and probably there's there's a young guy, um, George Bell, who's from Longford, and he's over there as a sports scientist and mm. would have touched base with him. Uh, to go over to a game actually last year and uh, he's filling me in on some of some of the, the stuff from it and you're like Jesus do you know what that is it's it's interesting to hear I think a lot of the players would have talked about this murder ball um, mm-hmm. where they're just going to hammer and tongs for as long as they can um, playing the ball would just stay in play for as long as possible or for a set time and you're looking at that intensity and how how do they play the way they play uh, in the Premiership? And it's probably f- from the way they train. So, getting an insight into those kind of teams would would definitely be something that you'd be keen as a as a coach to to see. 
Yeah, definitely. Uh, I, I'm going to rob another question from that high performance podcast. What are the three non negotiable or non acceptable behaviors uh, of an inter county footballer? Non negotiable and non acceptable. Now, they're, 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 they could be quite different. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Drinking the night before is not acceptable. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, non negotiable. Um, Look at time is definitely um punctuality and being on time. Look at things crop up in life and there's times where look at you can't always, but being being punctual is definitely something. Um and then just when you are coming to train that you're coming with, with an attitude to, to work um and with the same kind of attitude day in, day out. I think that consistency um in 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 work rate and your attitude towards training is something that I think it's neglected that some some people underestimate that okay I trained really well there today and um, I should be getting in the starting team this weekend and then uh, throw a hissy fit if if they don't make the team and you're looking back was like you put in one good training session in the last three weeks and you think that that's okay I was like yeah well I scored whatever it doesn't work that way it's kind of consistency over time and I think um, that comes with coming to train and with the being on time and that work rate that you're you're going to train the way you, you want to play. Um, and I think that's something that's overlooked. Um, that lads approach training and say, ah, I go to the floor today. I'm not feeling it. I'm not in good form. Mm-hmm. Had a long day at work. I'm tired. Uh, but you know the game doesn't really allow for that. That you kind of have to kind of put on the blinkers and just forget everything that's after happening and kind of get the most out of yourself rather than okay i'm not feeling it today and there are times if you're not feeling it sometimes you might have to just take a step back and, and flag that and say look it's probably best to, to sit this one out but uh, a lot of the time that you feel a hundred times better for actually putting your shoulders to the wheel and putting the head down and grinding and um, rather than sulking and moaning and kind of oh looking at the watch when's this session going to be over and um, let's get out of here so mm-hmm. uh, that consistency in, in, in training and, and that consistency in, in, in work rate to, to put in those efforts um, mm-hmm. and probably would have touched on it before that that leads to that delayed gratification. Um, mm-hmm. I think everyone wants results straight away and it kind of goes hand in hand. You know, if you play well in training, I should be playing this weekend. But mm-hmm. I mean, you're only back from injury. You haven't trained in the last three weeks. You know, it, it you have to put in the shift um mm-hmm. to get that delayed gratification um rather than just hoping for a quick reward straight away because you might get the reward but or get get the start but the performance inevitably isn't going to be up to scratch. Yeah, okay. I'm gonna move on to the sideline seven. It's the seven same seven questions for every single guest. I'm gonna start off with question one. What is your favorite quote? Oh, consistent, uh, consistent habits equals consistent performance. The habits seem to be your kind of go to. Yeah, I'm on that habit buzz now at the moment. Yeah. I don't know what, book, what 20 pages of the book I read there. <laughs> uh, question two best sporting event you've been to, and that can be as a fan or as a player. Look, you can't go past All Ireland Day, but Anzac Day in, in Australia, um, Essendon versus. Uh, Collingwood, um, and yeah. it's the only game played on that day and um, every year and um, for for Anzac Day um, and hundred hundred thousand in the MCG and wow. it's just phenomenal. Like I've never got to an AFL grand final, but that was just a couple of them and it's something something special. Yeah, that sounds pretty spectacular. And um, be- biggest setback or challenge so far in your career? Um yeah, probably injury break my ankle um would have been probably the biggest one that's like, okay, can you can you come back from it? And probably that was that was one and probably returning returning home that you kinda uh, from Australia that you were kinda thinking, Am I doing the right thing or am I seen as a failure because I'm coming back? Um and then probably putting putting the shoulder to the wheel and, and kind of putting in uh, the train and then when you did get back to mm-hmm. to to get back to that level from the injury and also when returning home from Australia. Mm. 
Uh, biggest achievement on or off the pitch? Um, yeah, it's funny too. Biggest achievement. Yeah, I'm kind of, because you're still playing, I kind of never really um, get too caught up in individual or even team to that matter. Um, yeah. You know, to, to win titles or club championships with, with your um with your friends growing up is definitely something. I suppose playing for my country um, with international rules is definitely something that I like, like probably will be will be my biggest achievement when when you do mention it that to get that opportunity um, and come back that year was probably one of the most successful years. Um, 2015 uh, Sigerson and um, playing for my country uh, club championship um, it was definitely a year where things all fell into place almost and probably mm. if I look back on or what I was doing then uh, something that uh, I could definitely try and take bits and pieces from so yeah that would be definitely my my biggest one uh, Dream dinner guest and why? Oh. You can pick um, a few now if you want. Yeah, it's funny too. I'm a big League of Their Own fan. Um, and Freddie Flintoff is someone that uh, I reckon would be quite a character. Um, yeah. You know, you'd love to... Some of those coaches that we mentioned before as well um, might need a translator for one or two. <laughs> <laughs> so the dinner table will be building up very quickly. Um, yeah. But... Yeah, look, you kind of you want someone there that you're going to have to crack with and, and yeah. have fun, um, and someone that's a good storyteller. So, uh, as well as trying to pick someone's brains and, and get yeah. some some good stuff from from the coaching and, and playing point of view. So, anyone along, along those lines, I think at this yeah. stage you take you take anyone as a dinner guest for a change up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> definitely. A final question: If your life was a book, what chapter would this be called? The wind down. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, yeah, I kind of look at it. It's kind of it's it's almost like I feel that probably the way things worked out this year, taking a step back from the county and um, mm. having case having case there um, and having a baby girl, uh, kind of put things in perspective. The important things of having family and friends uh, was more important than football, and um, but. I suppose it kind of that's that's why I play is probably you play so that your family and friends can kind of enjoy the games um, and that's something that probably one of the reasons why I returned home from from Australia in, in the end that you're missing that kind of connection with home and with your family and friends and um, so you know it's it's something that uh, the last few months have, have really hit home why you play um, yeah. and probably one of my reasons for stepping back and um, that the family was everything um, and it was the most important thing uh, the last few months so look at, I'm looking forward to when things get back to some sort of normality that you can kind of get back to those days again definitely yeah look Mickey thank you so much for your time I really enjoyed that and we'll definitely we'll definitely keep in touch super thanks Mel Orla massive thank you to Mickey for coming on today. I thoroughly enjoyed our chat and I took a lot away from the conversation. If you got some value from the episode, be sure to let me know over on Twitter or Instagram at The Sideline Life. If you are listening on Apple Podcasts and you did enjoy the episode, be sure to leave a rating and a review. If you're interested in starting up your own podcast, be sure to get in touch with the Primal Productions team over on Instagram at Primal Pro. Primal Pro.